Thank you, Yujan. Um, I think uh, a big thanks to uh, all our four uh, presenters to, uh, for keeping um, their time limits. So now may I invite uh, the two discussants of paper one, Professor Liu Jian and uh, Dr. Siddiq Vahed, uh, to please come and uh, share their thoughts with us. And quickly to, uh, to invite, uh, to dis oh, yeah. To uh, just, um, uh, Professor Liu Jian is senior professor at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And Dr. Siddiq Vaid is a distinguished expert on India-China studies and also an adjunct fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies based in Delhi. Do you want me to go first? The first paper first, or? The first paper, yes, please. Okay. okay. So that is Dr. Utamlal offered us a very interesting paper. And I know that uh, in this area that uh, Indian scholar Professor uh, Madhavi Tampi with the Delhi University, she made some studies of the, this area, the cross-border trade uh, between China and India. Uh, in China, uh, scholars in the past have uh, done some research work. But this, has, mm, this area has been neglected for a long time. I have not uh, uh, come across any paper like this. The reason is apparent that uh, you also mentioned that in your paper. Uh, the scholars in both countries uh, find it hard to get uh, uh, access uh, to the remote areas, uh, border areas of the two countries. And in your paper that you point out a very important uh, uh, phenomenon. That is the cross-border, cross-border uh, interaction, religious, uh, culture, etc. Uh, came to a standstill, uh, came to a, almost a knot uh, in middle 20th century. Uh, you also tried to explore the reasons for this. I think that was to be you are right to mention that it was because that uh, uh, nation states uh, were uh, created at that time, and uh, people in India and in China in border areas had uh, formed their uh, notion of a country. Then the border, the boundaries. Then this uh, that and gave uh, great uh, restrictions and limitations uh, to the uh, cultural, religious, and economic activities uh, that used to be very uh, flourishing uh, between the two countries. You mentioned uh, three routes. In fact, there was uh, another route that was uh, from uh, Assam uh, while uh, Burma to Yunnan. And in ancient times, in 2,000 years ago, in the uh, uh, first, uh, second uh, century BC, uh, also Chinese uh, uh, who went to Afghanistan found that uh, some Chinese goods uh, sold there by Indians. And the Chinese goods were produced in Yunnan and the Sichuan. They went, uh, went through Burma to India, then all the way to Afghanistan. Uh, in fact, that uh, this uh, uh, you also connected uh, your research finally uh, to the, with uh, all the problems uh, with the relations of the two countries and uh, put forth your suggestions and your prospect of a solution of the problems. Uh, that uh, in addition to the, the uh, that trade routes you mentioned that not only silk but also many other important. Uh, Articles. We know that uh, uh, before 1949, the uh, founding of the People's Republic of China, that uh, Indian merchants, uh, even money, la money lenders, came to Xinjiang. Uh, we could uh, find there these Indian people uh, that are very active in the oases in towns in south, uh, southern and uh, northern uh, Xinjiang. Money lenders, uh, traders, a uh, lot of them. And there was uh, even uh, Hindi uh, 
hotels, especially uh, opened for Indian traders. And uh, some Indian traders even settled down in China and got married with local people. And also between Nepal and uh, Tibet, there was also con close uh, connect and economic uh, connection in the past uh, for more than 1,000 years. And uh, uh, there is an uh, epic in Nepal, uh, Muna Madan, uh, that uh, Muna Madan told us the story, the emotional connection and uh, financial activities uh, um, of uh, Nepal traders in uh, Tibet. It seems, it seems that it could make easy fortunes uh, in Tibet. They worked there for uh, several months, uh, uh, six months. Then, then they could earn sacks of gold and they became rich when they returned to their home. Uh, this, of course, stopped uh, uh, in early in the uh, middle uh, 20th centuries. I think that uh, since uh, historically the two countries are so were so uh, closely connected in many aspects, not only in religion but also in trade, and uh, we need to still further our studies. You have uh, done a very excellent job. I think that it was not easy. You had uh, conducted many interviews with uh, different people. Therefore, I really like your paper and your work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu Jian. May I invite uh, Dr. Siddiq Wyatt to present his comments, please? Thank you. Um, thank you. I, um, I've sort of got three categories of reaction to it. One is an overall reaction. Then I think there are some sort of things uh, in the paper itself. Uh, that are very specific, which I won't go through here. Maybe we can sit down later on and, and talk about it. And then some suggestions from a theoretical point of view um, as to how you might want to look at the paper. Uh, first of all, it's a great title. I mean, uh, I, and I got very excited uh, by you know the suturing fragmented geographies and fragmented land trade routes or, or land routes. I, I think uh, sometimes uh, the titles become very ambitious. You know, and so then to sort of you know, make sure that you don't bite off more than you can chew, uh, it becomes a very, very difficult problem. You know, so I think that this is something uh, that you need to take a look at. I think that there were some very good positive points that you made in the paper. One is that even provinces or states in the Indian context are not homogeneous. Um, and I can say also that districts are not homogeneous, as you well know, I mean, co coming from the area. So I think that that uh, kind of, and some of these overall suggestions you might want to pick up on and expand on vis-a-vis uh, -vis the paper. Uh, the other thing is that it's an exciting topic, borderlands, you know, and I think that uh, there is a need for injection of some sort of theoretical uh, stuff on borderlands um, and the center periphery core uh, discourse that you sort of initiate and, and it, needs, it needs to be expanded on. Um, I think that you talk about lack of infrastructure and, and what that means um, you know, for, for the lack of trade, if you will, or whatever. Um, I think you need to ask the question of why uh, there is lack of infrastructure a little more rigorously. Um, and see where it goes. Um, I think the most interesting part of your paper was suturing suggestions. Um, you know, the suggestions for how to suture. And I'll have a little more to say on that. And certainly, um, I think a lot more time needs to be spent on the paper, in the paper, on that topic. Uh, because I think that's the meat of it. Uh, what do we do? And, and where do we go from here? Uh, as I said, I mean, there are some issues reading, uh, regarding citations, expansion, some of which I mentioned, um, and, and some good thoughts on, or, 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 which need to be further honed and, and refined. And I think, I think that that's something you should address. Theoretically, um, you make a statement that, uh, you know, Silk Route, again and again, I think, that the Silk Route is an umbrella term. Uh, and so forth. I mean, being an Eurasianist, and a Eurasian sort of uh, a person looking at Eurasian history, uh, it's not an umbrella term. 
Um, and uh, it's a very specific term, meaning a very specific thing. And that uh, you need to pay attention to. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with if you want to theorize and uh, sort of you know defend the idea that it's an umbrella term and that it's not a very useful term. It has been done in scholarship before. Uh, but then it's a different paper altogether. And it won't work with a footnote, or it won't work with just uh, a few paragraphs. I mean, it, it needs to be looked at very carefully. Um, the other thing uh, is that I think you need to address the issue of how the modernist state uh, somehow makes a shift between, you know, sort of concern for people versus concern for territory. Um, all states are very territory specific. I mean, that's no question. If ever since they existed, they are. But the point is, is that as we come into modernity and the so-called postmodern period, uh, I mean, you know, territory seems to be acquiring more and more an important issue, uh, and people less and less so. You know, and what is it? I mean, I think that this speaks to a very core element of your paper. Um, I think you make a, need to make a distinction between referring to borderlands and to frontiers, two different things altogether. You know, and there's a lot of theoretical work on that. You need to address it. You need to push it, and then, and I, and I think it'll become a very important thing. I, I, I paper because I think that it's a question of. Why is it when, t uh, w when the borders are concerned uh, that most establishments uh, seem to address security issues, territorial security issues, and not people's security issues and people's issues? And that, I mean, I think that elliptically or rather by inference, you mentioned it many times, but to pull it together as it's uh, going to be important. Finally, suturing. Um, I think your suturing suggestions, as I said earlier, were great. You know, there were two categories. One was pilgrimage, Buddhist studies, medical, whatever, knowledge, I think, uh, in the borderlands. And as you know, in the Himalaya, medical knowledge, I mean, I think there's an amazing wealth of it, all the way from Ladakh to uh, the Northeast, um, you know, and, and Arunachal. And how do we pull it together and stuff? And that's one aspect of it. The other one is you mentioned that suturing could be done through energy corridors and wilderness uh, management and cryosphere stuff, uh, if I may. Uh, these are two diametrically, I mean, not diametrically opposed, but two very, very different categories of people. I mean, for example, I would argue that energy corridors helping people in the region, I don't think so. You know, it's it states making an a necessity, I mean, a virtue out of necessity, because, I mean, they can't, I mean, they're going through the land. Uh, so w whether it's it's uh, you know in Bangladesh or in Pakistan, uh, it is to acquire things. And at the end of the day, in the core periphery uh, discourse, it means that somehow it is for the periphery. I mean, it is for the core that you build a road, that you get energy, that you do everything. And in the pe meantime, people are willing by this. Uh, one example of it, for example, is uh, in uh, Gilgit Baltistan uh, area great development taking place. Is it? Or is it just that you know, it needs to get to the port? And so you need to build the Karakoram Road. You need to strengthen it. Similarly, in the Northeast, I'm less familiar with the Northeast um, of South Asia. But is it just that because it happens to be there? You know, you have to build the road through it. And so therefore, look east. I mean, what's that supposed to mean? Maybe that's why it's not. Uh, hasn't picked up as, as much as the Loki's policy should pick up. All in all, a great paper, great topic, even more. Uh, I think that strengthening it uh, is, is something, obviously, that you're in the process of. Be more than happy to help. So good, uh, since we are on the same continent. Thank you. Thank you, Sadiq. Uh, <coughs> Thanks to both our um, discussants. Uh, I'd like to now invite um, the discussants for paper two, uh, Paula Banerjee and Sanjay Reddy. Um, let me quickly and uh, briefly introduce both of them. Paula Banerjee is Associate Professor at the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Calcutta. And she's also visiting Fulbright's uh, Scholar um, with the State University of New York. And Sanjay Reddy is Associate Professor of Economics at the New School for social research and also co-academic director of the ICI. No, I'm from Syracuse this time. Okay. 
Paula, would you like to go first? Sure, of course. Um, actually, um, um, what is most interesting about uh, this paper is the way it's situated. And I think uh, Nimi did a wonderful job of talking about it as flows. So this is a completely different kind of a flow that we are talking about. And after Uttam's paper, you know, this micro narrative, you come to this meta narrative of um, English language and attitude to English language. What I find most interesting about the paper is actually its lack. And that is the comparison between India and China. And probably that should have been sort of the core of the paper. So I would really urge uh, um, you know, the, the author to, to sort of rethink the paper around this, this very, very interesting and important theme of uh, why, in, you know, for Indians, English language acquired this uh, specific place, whereas for China, it did not. And, and uh, to begin that discourse, I think uh, one of the other, um, uh, well, um, lacks in this paper is uh, the discourse on colonialism. It's there, but still not there. And um, you know, for, for a paper uh, which is titled as uh, Indian Attitude Towards English, I think one has to address the question of uh, colonialism in a much more frontal sort of a way. And, and I think um, you know, I'm going to urge that uh, the author uh, looks towards that. There are a lot of uh, very, very interesting ideas in this. Uh, paper ideas on symbols, on metaphors, and all of that. But because I have just five minutes, I'm going to give suggestions about things that are not there. So that should not detract us from the merit of this study, which is extremely ambitious, I would say. And, and that's why it's so much more difficult. So having taken that into consideration, I, I would say that you know one of the first things that probably you know, it, it's a very classical way of looking at a paper, but I think it has its own value. And that is, um, uh, when we were taught to write a paper, we were always asked that go through the literature and tell us what's new in it. And, and I think this is a question that would recur over and over again as to what is the value of this uh, contention. You know, because the, the, the question of uh, English language is a much studied field within Indian history, within the genre of history. Indian history. And um, uh, what makes it even more uh, ambitious is this leap between the colonial period and then the so-called post-colonial period, or the period where maybe there is post-coloniality without much of a decolonization, whichever way you look at it. And uh, um, so you know, in, in trying to do both, I think there has been a certain lapses and lacks happening, which needs to be plugged in and looked into. One of the most important thing is the, the author starts by saying, what the paper is not. And it is not about individual discourses on English language, um, yet everywhere I see people's attitude. Who are these people that we are addressing to? If it's not an individual discourse, what kind of a discourse is it? Is it a nationalist discourse? Is it a colonial discourse? Is it an institutional discourse? All of these discourses have their own histories that needs to be addressed. And, and suddenly, by throwing in um, Thomas Babington Macaulay's um, discussions on it, it, it makes it even more controversial. Because if one is trying to push the colonial or the administrative discourse, one really needs to start with the Charter Acts. And, and there are a series of uh, you know, those acts. And I, I particularly remember the Charter Act of uh, 1813, where there is this huge debate as to uh, whether what kind of an education India should have. And, and if, if that discourse is privileged, then the problem is we shouldn't really call it the people's discourse at all. Because um, you know, uh, very, very little of the people, as we know, was ever involved in it. I am not the greatest fan of the subaltern studies. But even I would urge uh, the author to, to look at that discourse as well, because uh, 
you know, who are these people that we are talking about? Because I'm particularly sensitive to the term people because it, it presents this homogeneous identity. And as the pre previous presentation shows, there is no homogeneity in the kind of identities that we are talking about or the discourses we are talking about. And I, I particularly feel the lack of, you know, um, certain, certain factors like ethnicity, gender, etc. you know, in much of these uh, a presentation and and uh, the other thing um, you know um, that I would like to talk about is again um, the, this leap between history and then the present period it's it's very ambitious if one can pull it off it's fantastic or, or maybe it would be good to keep the history as a prologue and then talk about the present period because there is a lot of studies theoretically done on attitudes and one really needs to know about what sources the author has uh, taken into consideration because when I looked at uh, the literature, it's largely an amalgamation of secondary literature and particularly keeping in mind that the author is a student of, uh, you know, is a PhD candidate. It would be really interesting to look at what kind of sources uh, she would like to look into or she's looking into. And the other big lack that I thought would probably have sort of, you know, supported her own thesis is the lack of uh, popular culture in the present period. Because, you know, if, if one looks at uh, uh, English language and its impact um, and Indian attitude towards English, one, one has to look at popular culture. I remember in 2007 in New York Times, there was this fantastic article into what, you know, pencil sellers all over rural India were actually marketing their pencils in English language. Um, because, uh, but, but I like the point that you know um, that much of Indian languages, you know, this whole process of hierarchization of Indian languages and its fight against that is something that has brought um, English language frontally. Uh, but but that point has also been made before. So you know, uh, you know, I, I would urge the author as a finishing comment to say that you know the meat of the presentation is actually its comparison with China. And there is very little of China that I found here that it could have been done in a wonderful way at looking at you know why colonialism the world over brings in this whole notion of languages. Because if you look at the Maghreb region or Africa or even Latin America, one sees the, the, you know, the potency of language and colonialism and that dyad coming together. Whereas in other areas like Thailand, where there has been no frontal colonialism, even in China, one doesn't see so much of importance of a foreign language like English. And my last question is, is English really foreign to India? Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Paula. Uh, Sanjay? Thank you. Thanks, Nimi. Uh, I very much enjoyed reading the paper and listening to the presentation. Thank you, uh, Zui. I, um, should say I don't have special, any, in fact, special competence uh, on this topic. And so I'm very glad to follow Professor Banerjee, who has said much of what should have been said and uh, with much more uh, relevant expertise uh, behind her uh, remarks. That having been said, I am happy to declaim about various topics if given an mm. opportunity. I'm not sure why I was asked to speak on this, but having been asked, I'm happy to seek your indulgence. Uh, as Professor Banerjee had, uh, had uh, suggested, perhaps this paper should be thought of in some sense as a prolegomenon, a beginning. I think that the author has done a very good job of s describing some of the relevant background considerations and uh, literature. But uh, as Professor Banerjee said, there's a lot that's been written on this subject uh, from various angles, and it could be introduced more. And in some sense, what I really want to urge her to do is to take a more sociological view or historical sociological view, introduce political economy considerations of various kinds concerning why languages are adopted, rise to prominence, rise to a certain position in a society or indeed in the world as a whole, and to make that much more a part of her account, whereas currently it seems to be much more about, in some sense, uh, elite discourse concerning uh, language adoption or use, 
uh, with some attention to some of the ambivalences and tensions which are involved there, including the psychological and political aspects thereof. But she does, of course, point to some relevant uh, literature which would, or would lead in the sociological direction, for instance, in her reference to Braj Kachru's work on uh, English and its different roles in the world, uh, different, its three worlds, in yeah. fact. Uh, I want to um, suggest a few disparate thoughts which may be relevant as you develop this work. One of them is that I think that it may be interesting and useful for you to think about languages foreign languages, so-called foreign languages, in general, and not just English. Uh, because uh, certainly in the Chinese case, it would seem that the idea of English as the preeminent foreign language to be learned is fairly recent, as it is in much of the world, even if it has been the case for a long time. It wasn't the case in, in the early or mid-19th century that it was a foregone conclusion that English would be the preeminent language. Certainly, we know that the Chinese people considered it a great insult correctly that the European colonial powers were seeking to divide up China and there were different concessions which were which existed and so forth. So the question of, um, and indeed uh, the Japanese uh, among them, so the, the question of what allows a particular foreign language to rise to dominance within a country or indeed globally is an interesting one and from a broad sociological point of view. You may be aware that in um, Africa currently there are some moves among the countries which had the misfortune to be colonized by countries other than Britain to overthrow their existing colonial linguistic <laughs> inheritance in favor of English. You know, Mozambique went so far as to join the Commonwealth quite recently as a way of doing this. Uh, and of course, there were riots in Cote d'Ivoire, you may be aware of, where you know, people were the, 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 um, in the south, uh, the activists there were carrying around American flags and demanding that English be taught rather than French in the schools and so forth. Not British flags, of course, American flags, because that's the relevant uh, form that the English language appears today to people. Uh, uh, this is as good a point at any as I suppose to mention the thought, the famous uh, uh, linguistic um, slogan, uh, which is which which I, I believe um, is of uncertain uh, origin, that uh, a um, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. <laughs> uh, so the idea that India has is a, is a country with many languages, but China has one language, has to be viewed in this light. You know, that uh, it is not entirely obvious why we view China as having one language and India as having many languages. And I think if we want to think about that, we have to think in terms of the state-centric civilizational perspective in China um, as a subjective experience and uh, the way in which that conditions Chinese tendencies to think of these entities we could consider different languages as different uh, dialects, perhaps. But I'm no expert on this. Other people are really verging into territory, which I'm completely, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm really an improper um, interlocutor in. Let me also say in that connection that I think it's important for you to be aware of and investigate more deeply as you develop this the gradient, sociological gradient of English language competence in India. And how you, in other words, the question of, of who, well, first of all, the awareness that different people have different levels of English language competence that has differential histories behind it. It has ongoing social and political uh, content and implications, valences. Uh, there are certain groups which had a head start in some sense in the acquisition of English, and this is all important to understanding contemporary dominance hierarchies in India. And of course, the relationship between the English language and the state, as well as commerce, not, all, not only in its current globalized moment, but earlier, has to be apprehended. Of course, this is not true only in India. It's true in many parts of the world. And uh, I think if you went into the history of who learned English first in China, you might well find that something similar has to be understood and described. What is the role of Christianity in that? Uh, and other such relevant uh, historical uh, phenomena. I think, I think that um, you have to look at this in terms of contemporary uh, political discourse on caste and, uh, and class. Uh, the English language acquisition, the aspiration for English language ac acquisition plays a very important role as well as the question, as you note, of English as a more liberatory language in some sense. Uh, uh, so uh, please bring in <laughs> more of that uh, kind of uh, portraiture. I think uh, it would help a great deal. Um, 
the lack of a cultural revolution or anything like it in India uh, to uh, bring about some disruption <laughs> of this, these hierarchies. It's sometimes talked about by Indians, especially those on the left. And I think, um, I think uh, that would be interesting to inquire into, whether that has any implications. We often think about English as only being an advantage, the, the existence of very large numbers of people who speak English. But it is also a disadvantage from the point of view of what used to be called quaintly in Indian state-centric discourse, national integration. Mm -hmm. But even as a, as a historian and sociologist such as Ernest Gellner pointed out rather simplistically, but nevertheless relevantly, in terms of the everyday work of nation state activity uh, or uh, functions, functioning, that um, uh, uh, unitary, um, having a unitary language is tremendously useful in terms of certain kinds of coordination. Uh, and uh, to, to the extent this can be a, a, a language which is truly adopted by the mass of the people, <laughs> this has certain functional advantages. Um, and uh, uh, I think China shows that in certain ways. And there's, there's a reason that China chose one of those dialects slash languages and mm -hmm. propagated it. India has attempted to do the same, arguably less successfully, but still successfully. And that's a sense in which India today is very, or even China today, are different from, in a different position than they were 50 or 60 years ago, or 100 years ago, in terms of this Gelnerian activity of nation state construction, uh, which we may not all like, those of us who wish to celebrate margins and diversities of various kinds, but it remains a fact that, as was pointed out in the last panel, this has a certain kind of, uh, 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 of attractiveness from the point of view of, um, of, uh, of the state. So I, I suspect I have gone on already much too long. One sentence, though, I might like to add if I have sure. half a minute, because Ashok asked me also to comment on yes. uh, Min's uh, presentation, next one. Shall I wait? But I just want to add one minute on that, or half a minute, so maybe it's easier for me to do it here, sure, rather than, because I don't want to take up time from the other people, which is. Oh, there's only one other person. All right, then I'll wait. OK, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sanjay and Paula. <laughs> there's a slight uh, uh, change in the, uh, in, in the schedule. Uh, one of our discussants is unable to join us, uh, Chin Kao, because she's uh, unwell. So um, both Sanjay and <laughs> Professor San yeah, Sanjay and uh, Professor Soy so H. Chuan have uh, graciously at, you know, agreed to step in at the last minute to provide additional comments. So um, Vamsi would uh, give the detailed comments, and uh, Sanjay and Professor Tsoi will um, give additional comments. Uh, grateful to uh, all three of you. And uh, let me quickly introduce um, uh, uh, Vamsi uh, Vakula Barnam, Associate Professor at the uh, Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Hyderabad and Visiting Scholar at the ICI. Vamsi. Should I start? Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you, Nimi. Um, so I have a few uh, comments that are uh, that I hope are useful to you. Uh, so the first, uh, you know, broad comment is that it's uh, I think it's an interesting contrast between India and China. On the whole, I thought it was uh, also accurate. In fact, uh, you know, uh, going back to an anecdote, you know, from the mid '90s when I was doing grad school in Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, you know, a Chinese group came, you know, and they were talking to the grad students. And they saw me and they asked me, well, the diaspora in China, uh, you know, the Chinese diaspora has done a lot for our development. What has your diaspora done? And I had very little to say at that point in time. I was a little uh, taken aback by that question. And I think, you know, uh, if one imagines that let's say these two large countries did not have any substantial diasporas, uh, the Chinese path of development might have been very different, uh, whereas the Indian path, you know, in my intuition, would not have been so different, probably, right? So in that sense, you know, what you're capturing in your uh, paper is somewhat accurate. Uh, but we can, you know, discuss that further. <laughs> but, but, you know, this is... Uh, uh, while it's an accurate uh, view, as I said, you know, anecdotally earlier, uh, it's also a known view. 
that you know the Chinese diaspora had a much stronger role to play in the overall development of China. So, so here I have a few critiques, critical points, uh, you know, about uh, the overall paper. Uh, I don't know if you are asked to work on FDI, uh, but uh, you know, you, your title basically said, you know, diasporic impact on the diffusion of capitalism in these two countries. So, if you had not focused entirely on FDI you might have uh, actually looked at other phenomena that are of interest, especially in the Indian case. So uh, a, a, a broad sort of theoretical critique of the paper is, you know, uh, I think the entire argument is made from a, uh, a, a supply side kind of a model, right? Not demand side, but supply side kind of model. Uh, and there are many routes to generating capital uh, in a supply side model, but they would be mostly, uh, you know, how savings are generated either domestically or uh, you know outside the country uh, and the other aspect of the supply side model is you know how technology comes in or how knowledge is built you know these kinds of things uh, and i think in this broad context uh, uh, you know uh, the analysis of the importance of the chinese diaspora uh, in supplying ideas or influencing policy or supplying technology as well as capital you know ideas and resources as you call it uh, I think it's convincing, you know, on the whole. Uh, you know, at least uh, uh, for me, who is an outsider, who has only read secondary literature. However, in the Indian case, uh, you know, barring the software in industry, uh, you argue that you know it's uh, the diasporic influence is mainly in terms of uh, ideas and the people who actually returned from the U.S. You know, who took up important positions in the government or the planning commission and so forth. Uh, but given the supply side model that you adopt, certain things become, uh, you know, not so visible to you. So, for instance, if you looked at the, you know, very recent World Bank report on remittances, for instance, you know, in the last couple of days, it's all over the news. Uh, you know, uh, India continues to be, uh, you know, you know, the highest, uh, uh, you know, the destination for the highest amount of remittances. And last year, they got something like $70 billion. Right? China is second. I mean, China also is not insignificant. It got $65 billion. But over the last 20, 25 years, uh, India has been almost consistently topping uh, you know, the remittance destination. So why is this important? If you actually adopt a demand side model, right? Uh, there, is, there has been a very significant demand side influence of remittances on overall economic development. Okay, so uh, it's not uh, just FDI. I mean, if you technically take FDI, you can't count uh, remittances as part of FDI. But you know, these are uh, you know, th this is money that's flowing into the country. And if you take, uh, let me just give you two examples, right? The state where I come from, Andhra Pradesh, uh, which may not last too long. Uh, it may it may split into two states, uh, but uh, the other state uh, you know about which I know a little is uh, Kerala, right? So if you look at these two states and look at the impact of remittances, uh, you know there's a substantial impact. You know you can look at uh, uh, you know agricultural investments for instance, right? A lot of investments have gone into agriculture, uh, and uh, you look at uh, something like construction or real estate. You know, Kerala is actually a booming economy right now. If you if you look at the last 20 years, uh, the old Kerala model is passe. Uh, you know, the uh, the low growth, you know, high uh, human development kind of a model is passe now. Uh, it's a very high growth model right now. And where is this uh, high growth impetus coming from? It's primarily through uh, remittances that Kerala receives. You know, from uh, not very professional migrants, but actually low wage migrants in the Middle East and so forth. Right, you focus entirely on uh, the professional diaspora, but you know this has come back and altered very significantly. Uh, you know these two economies, and uh, the, you know the uh, the remittances have altered the growth rates in these economies. They've changed the class structures in these economies. They've affected the inequality levels. Uh, in many cases, uh, heightened the inequality levels uh, in these economies. Right. So, so in a broad sense, uh, you know, uh, focusing just on FDI may not give you an accurate picture on uh, what's going on in the Indian case if you want to estimate the diasporic impact. Okay, so that's, uh, and 
you know, a broader comment on your model, you know, I think uh, even if you do a supply side model, uh, I think your analytical structure may be a little uh, uh, too broad or a little too uh, loosely structured so that, you know, uh, we do not know exactly what role uh, these diasporas are, uh, diasporas are playing uh, in India and China. Uh, you know, we have that, uh, you know, that diagram you drew, which is somewhat broad, but, you know, what are the exact mechanisms? Can you actually provide uh, uh, good sources? In the Chinese case, I did see, you know, that there was some rigorous work in the, about the late 70s and 80s. But in the Indian case, it's not so clear. It's too broad. So, you know, can you provide some data or, you know, some sources to make a rigorous set of comments on how diasporas actually influence the, uh, you know, overall, uh, uh, you know, M development of capitalism, as you call it. And uh, uh, the last point is, you know, uh, it's a general point about the tone of the paper. Uh, it almost seems uh, that, you know, you've uncritically accepted that, you know, the liberal economic model is desirable and, you know, diasporas are actually feeding into uh, a, a development of, uh, you know, that sort of a model. And this is uh, generally good for these two countries. Uh, I would, you know, uh, I don't want to assume that. I think, you know, it's good to take a critical or reflexive kind of position on this, uh, especially after the global crisis of 2008, uh, when these two countries are now, you know, they have to focus much more domestically, cut down inequalities, you know, build up domestic demand. Uh, so, you know, uh, a, a sort of uh, an acceptance of uh, external trade uh, liberalization or, you know, liberalization of uh, FDI is not necessarily the route that these two countries have to take in the coming decade or two. So, you know, in that sense, you know, maybe a little bit of critique of uh, or self-consciousness of the position you are taking might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amsi. Uh, may I invite uh, Professor Tsui um, Chiyuan to give his comments, please? Uh, or would you, would... Uh... No, 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 I prefer, I prefer you go first, if you don't mind. Let me quickly introduce uh, Professor uh, Choi um, uh, Chiyuan is professor at the School of Public Policy and Management at the Tsinghua University and also visiting uh, professor, uh, visiting scholar at the ICI. Thank you. It's uh, my great pleasure to be here. And uh, but actually, I lack the expertise to comment on this paper. Especially, Ashok only asked me this morning as a replacement for another discussant who couldn't come this morning. But I, after listening to uh, uh, Professor Ye's talk, I, I also like, uh, find this a very uh, interesting and stimulating paper. I mean, uh, I agree with Wamsi. I mean, I think you identify an a, a, a interesting and valid pattern. And uh, I have not much add to what Wamsi's excellent comments on the, this importance of remittance. And, uh, I think, uh, for, for example, if you use the terminology of supplies, so if you still uh, uh, may, may mainly focus on the supply side. So another recent example to support your argument may be the, this high profile return of the central bank governor region um, to be, I mean, uh, to, from the University of Chicago back to India to, be, to become the central bank governor most recent uh, uh, phenomenon, very controversial, and uh, uh, about uh, uh, this, I wonder, this national holiday, whether or not you, you, you yeah, you, maybe you have touched on in your paper, I, I haven't seen your paper, uh, may play a role, and uh, otherwise I, uh, I would also encourage you to be uh, more specific on the mechanisms of the diaspora's influence, and uh, maybe one uh, example of this mechanism, uh, uh, in connection with Wemsey's request of you to be being more self-conscious and uh, critical about this new liberal project. Actually, I think the diaspora has a, a different influence in different regions regarding. Uh, the labor politics, like uh, strength of trade union. This may lead to the, uh, our next uh, discussion. For, for example, yeah, like in Guangdong area and the Zhejiang area, the trade union's power are different, I think. 
And, uh, um, and uh, this partly has to do uh, with the lack of diaspora, especially Hong Kong capitalist played in these two different regions. And uh, as you may have aware, the recently the, in the, since you, you mentioned the Shenzhen, right? so Shenzhen has recently had the third time reading of the revision of the labor contract law. This, but has not been passed by legislation, but the third time reading of uh, labor, labor contract law, which uh, uh, basically the difference between early uh, versions of the labor contract law is that they, um, so the, if the workers asked for collective bargaining, the enterprises must agree that's the new version. And the previous version is that when workers ask, the, they say the enterprise should agree the negotiation. But, but in fact, they may or may not. Uh, they only say should agree to the negotiation. But uh, this new version says they must agree. And, but this has not been passed because there are strong uh, oppositions from uh, uh, capitalists in Hong Kong. And they even go to the like a National People's Congress trying to uh, stop this. And, uh, but they are influenced, I mean, relatively speaking, in Zhejiang is uh, somewhat different. But uh, anyway, so uh, this is just a kind of example of more, uh, maybe looking for more concrete mechanisms of the diaspora's influence. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Tsui. Uh, Sanjay, may I request you? Thank you, let me just very briefly. Uh, thank you for the paper. I wanted to say that um, uh, in line with, with both of the previous commentators, uh, I think that uh, it may be easy to exaggerate the role of diasporas in certain respects. For instance, take the role in policy making. You had the very interesting table showing all of the World Bank alumni in policy making positions. One could produce such a table for almost any country in the world right now, you know, uh, many countries at any rate. Um, and uh, for that matter, you can look at the senior intellectuals in the communist movements in India and find that a good number of them graduated from British or American <laughs> universities. <laughs> so it's not immediately obvious, you know, what it is, what is it that, uh, well, what is the relation between education, even having had a job in the World Bank, though that's a pretty much, that's a lot clearer, I should say, uh, and having certain perspectives. Uh, and uh, I think if you want to ask the question, uh, what role did foreign education play or, or exposure to certain ideas? I think in the Indian case, you would find it did not play a decisive role so much as it played a legitimating role. <laughs> it's, it's, it's helpful to be able to say Montek Singhalualia is an expert technocrat who brings his vast years of international experience in the World Bank and IMF with him, or Raghuram Rajan is such a person. By the way, for the record, Montek Singhalualia does not have a PhD, uh, which you do say in your paper. He has an MPhil from Oxford. Not that it matters. I couldn't care less. But some people seem to think it matters. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you might want to make that clear. Um, so you know, it became useful at a certain stage to be able to say that we have the best uh, technocrats of this sort rather than of that sort. But if you look at the pre-1991 policymaking circles, you will find that the table doesn't look so different, uh, though their perspectives were very different. And uh, therefore, uh, some other explanatory factors have to be added to understand why there was a switch from one set of policy orientations to another. Um, similarly, uh, with respect to the role of diaspora in investment, I think this is much more tricky. Your table is very interesting about the, the, the sharp reduction in the percentage of FDI associated with uh, NRIs uh, or um, uh, the diaspora. It would be interesting to see the level as well as the percentage, because at the same time, you have a big increase in the overall level. So did the level also fall from uh, non-resident Indians, or was it just the percentage that fell so precipitously? I assume it's also the level, because you're showing a s stark reduction. I find it hard to believe that it's only 1% now. I wonder whether there, what kind of uh, measurement problems may be present there. But supposing that it's true, it's certainly a very stark figure. At the same time, there's an intangible role 
that uh, these that uh, intermediaries play who have international exposure. If you know the high-tech industries in Hyderabad, Bangalore, and so on, which you mentioned, especially in the middle and upper tier of these uh, industries, you have a lot of circulating labor of a high-end variety. You know, people with uh, engineering qualifications who go between Silicon Valley and Bangalore, Hyderabad. And those people are very important to structuring the industry. They may be small in number, but without them, <laughs> it yeah. uh, wouldn't work in the way it does as a globalized sector. So. Uh, I think there's a, there's a, to use neoclassical economics of recent vintage, there's an O-ring production, production function problem you have here, which is that you know, this, this one input might be very tiny, might look tiny, but it might be essential. The O-ring, you might remember, was the little, uh, what was it made of? R uh, it wasn't rubber, it was something else. But anyway, it was the little, little um, component of the space shuttle Challenger, mm. which was flawed. It was discovered later on when the space shuttle Challenger blew up that the reason with this was this tiny little o-ring you know which was which 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 blew out and the o-ring the cost of that o-ring relative to the space shuttle challenger was you know in minuscule it was incredibly small but it turned out that that imperfection led to the whole thing blowing up so uh, you know similarly you might say that there are certain kinds of interactions which are very crucial even though it might seem that they're not significant this is on your side of you know but i think that there's a little is it in the paper? I'm, I'm sorry, again, I was asked to read it. Um, I wasn't even asked to read it. I was given it <laughs> at, at the very moment this seminar began this morning. So I've only heard your presentation, so my apologies about that. But thank you very much. Then I fully agree with you. Thank you. She wants to go to software sector, I similar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks to all uh, three discussants. Uh, may I request um, Sanjay and uh, Oh, no, sorry, Avamsi and uh, Professor Soy to stay back to give their comments on the fourth paper, please. Thank you, Sanjay. Okay. <laughs> Should I? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, so the paper of, of uh, Yu Zheng on uh, institutions, labor mobility institutions, and uh, impact on FDI. Uh, I think you know the broad call that the paper makes is very valuable because uh, what you are saying is political factors are, are uh, very important and they have to be analyzed in conjunction with economic factors and don't just focus on the macro political factors like democracy versus authoritarian rule or autocracy uh, but actually get into the mechanisms you know the micro level institutions and then see how the macro level dynamics play out and I think you know that's a very healthy kind of uh, Call. Uh, and specifically, uh, you know, uh, the puzzle that you seem to set up is that, you know, China and India are so similar in 1978. In fact, India may be a little ahead in terms of urbanization. Uh, but right now, you know, uh, they have very different uh, levels and nature of FDI. Uh, and uh, China gets a lot more FDI, which is also vertically integrated. That's the distinction you make, whereas India gets uh, a lot less, but which is also horizontally integrated. So why is it that you know this sort of a divergence happens right over uh, the last 30 or 30 plus, uh, 35 years? Uh, and you focus on uh, the phenomenon of labor mobility defined both as occupational mobility, that is mobility across jobs, and uh, mobility, <coughs> spatial mobility, which is, you know, you take it, uh, you take uh, rural urban mobility as the proxy for spatial mobility, right? So that would be the, and you look at three institutions, you know, uh, one is the traditional institutions as you call them, caste and huko, uh, caste in India, huko in China, which are actually mobility impeding, both of them. But then you look at two other institutions, which are labor institutions and land institutions. And the general argument seems to be that China has more flexible labor and land institutions compared to India. So uh, that's where the you know puzzle, that's how the puzzle is explained, because China has more flexible institutions compared to the Indian institutions. So I have a number of problems with your argument. Okay, so the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the first uh, 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 thing is, you know. I'm not convinced that you are using very good data. This is serious because, uh, you know, for instance, your table two, uh, you know, you've show, you show that China has a total of 58 million workers in manufacturing 
and India has 52 million workers and uh, this just cannot be right. I mean, because uh, I don't know where you, uh, you know, took that data from, maybe it's from the yearbook. Uh, but uh, it's just, uh, you know, nobody is going to believe the, those numbers in the sense that, uh, and, you know, based on that, you show that 37% uh, of the workers in China are in the informal sector, right? But then, the, uh, you know, we all know that there are at least 150 to 200 million, at least, uh, migrants who have moved to urban spaces in China, right? We, I mean, if you are showing 58 million workers in manufacturing, where are all these migrants? So, so you know, uh, you need to actually answer that. I don't think, you know, that table captures the accurate data. Uh, and I have seen, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, other studies based on uh, chip data, for instance. Uh, you know, Chinese household income project, uh, you know, the surveys that are conducted. And they show that at least, uh, you know, about 60% of the workforce, uh, you know, in urban spaces is informal in China, whereas you show 37%. So the, the broader point I'm, uh, you know, I'm hinting at is, I think you are exaggerating the differences between India and China. I think you know, in China also has a huge informal sector, may not be as large as the Indian informal sector, but they're you know, more comparable than not. Okay, so that's uh, the first point about data. The second point is when it comes to labor institutions, uh, you, you know, you have taken, you know, the Besley Burgess argument, you know, about uh, how different Indian states have implemented labor legislation very differently, uh, and therefore, you know, the ones which are, uh, uh, because it's a concurrent subject, labor legislation is uh, both central as well as state, and, uh, you know, those states which have become more flexible have been at able to attract more investment. That's their argument, and this has been contested left, right, and center. You know, Besley Burgess argument is not uh, a sacred argument anymore. People have attacked it, and people have shown that, you know, it's actually uh, not very convincing in the Indian context. So why is it not convincing? Because on paper, you know, it's true that India has a lot more labor legislation. But the actual implementation, right, in different states is very lax. And I know this, you know, I also got involved in some labor disputes. You know, the implementation is extremely lax. And uh, this is, uh, and you know, as you show, 93% uh, of Indian uh, workers are in the informal sector, right? So the labor legislation doesn't even apply. You know, all the Indus Industrial Disputes Act and other uh, acts don't even apply to, uh, you know, these, uh, these workers. So, you know, the Besley Burgess argument doesn't work really. You know, so, you know, they may show it econometrically, but, you know, there may be other mechanisms for the results they are getting. Uh, and, you know, you talk about special economic zones where, you know, labor legislation is suspended completely in India, but uh, show the employment in case, you know, uh, uh, the, the flexible labor legislation is actually useful, where, is the, where are the numbers in terms of employment in the special economic zones? So once again, I think, you know, on paper India may have, may have more rigid labor uh, institutions, but in reality, right? they are a lot more flexible than you have projected in the paper. So again, the difference is exaggerated between China and India. The third point is, uh, again, when it comes to land regulation and the better compensation structures for the Indians, uh, you know, as opposed to the Chinese, you know, where the state, uh, you know, can claim land, you know, much more easily. Uh, you know, if you take out the uh, cases that became extremely uh, uh, big in the media, like Singur and Nandigram in Bengal, and you know a few other uh, identified cases across the rest of the country, uh, most of the special economic zones uh, that have been created, uh, you know, have uh, been done through a process where you know land has been acquired with relative ease, right? In the Indian situation, once again, the broad point is uh, that you know you are exaggerating the difference, looking at what is on paper between the Chinese and Indian cases. So if that is the main critique, then, you know, you don't have an answer to your puzzle, right? So uh, that, you know, the differences are vastly exaggerated in the paper than they actually are. Then what is your main critique? Uh, uh, you know, main uh, answer to the puzzle, the answer doesn't uh, remain as you pose it in your paper. So my guess is, and you can probably work on it as a hypothesis, 
I think you know uh, the Chinese model and the Indian model, right? Uh, uh, as uh, they began to experiment with it from the 1980s onwards, were very different from the beginning. I think Chinese, uh, uh, although 80s and 90s are very different in China, uh, I think uh, the commonality is you know China was using uh, you know uh, labor-intensive strategies from the very beginning. Right? If you take uh, township and village enterprises, uh, you know, that kind of an experiment uh, in the 80s, it was focused on labor intensive manufacturing. India never did that. Right? India always focused on uh, capital intensive kind of manufacturing. So I think uh, the differences in labor mobility are a consequence of the models that they adopted and not the other way around. So I would argue that you know, the causal structures in your case may have to be inverted. Right? But uh, you know, do think about it. And I was also left wondering, uh, this is my last point, uh, you know, I was also wondering after reading your paper, what the real end of development is. Right? Because in a way you are promoting uh, you know, uh, flexible labor institutions you know, where workers don't get good wages or they don't have security, they don't have uh, other benefits. Or you know, peasants you know, who <laughs> don't have enough protection. Uh, your paper almost celebrates that. This is how China reaches its development. I mean, I read your paper, so this is the sense I got. But that's not the real end of development. You know, if you really want to focus on uh, uh, these two countries and look at development of the majorities in these two countries, then you know, uh, how do they achieve better well-being? By being given security, by being given better wages, by being provided better incomes. So somewhere, you know, uh, while these institutions may work, to get FDI or you know to achieve higher growth, there's something perverse about the about the way these institutions have been transformed, right? So let me stop. Thank you. Thank you, Vamsi. Uh, Professor Tsai. Okay, so I, I always happy to be speaking after Vamsi because <laughs> he's. Uh, I asked you to go. No, 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 because he's so so smart and. Uh, and it makes uh, my job is easy. <laughs> okay. Basically, I think, uh, but really, I, um, I, I, I like the spirit of this paper. Because I think partly may reflect your early training at UCSD, right, University of California, San Diego. And uh, so do, do you, do, did you work with Susan Shirk? Yes. Yeah. I mean, as uh, many of you may know, that uh, like Susan Shirk wrote a very interesting book, Political Logic of Economic Reform in China. So I think your work continues this. Uh, uh, perspective emphasizing the political logic, uh, um, I mean, underlying the uh, economic policy choices, and the, and uh, um, uh, but I think similar to Wemsey, I uh, but I put it in a different way. Is that the how to set up your puzzle? So your puzzle is from a Hector-Oli model of comparative advantage, and that, that's you set up your model. But in the recent development in the trade theory, actually, uh, I mean, uh, this model has been, uh, I think, uh, challenged or surpassed, uh, I think, importantly, by um, this new idea, so-called uh, um, intra-product division of labor, because Hector only model based on the Interproduct division of labor based on a comparative advantage. Each country is specialized in one product uh, based on their comparative advantage. Another country specialized in another product based on their comparative advantage. But uh, the new development, especially since 1990s, based on the new practice in the world, is that the so the intraproduct division of labor, and uh, so the so, uh, all related to global uh, supply chain. Uh, Model. So, um, so I think uh, if we agree with Vemsi's comments that you maybe overemphasize the difference between India and China, and in the labor law implementation, actually the India and China are not that different. But if then maybe from you can recast your puzzle and uh, uh, maybe asking from this intra practice product division of labor and the uh, global supply chain perspective, um, <coughs> there may or may not uh, be still differences in the patterns of foreign direct inv investment in China and India. Uh, OK, I, I, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Sway and uh, Vamsi. Uh, I think we have about uh, 20 minutes or so for Q&A. Uh, the, yeah, the floor is open. <laughs> In the interest of feedback, Ashok suggests that we open the floor and get comments. Yeah, please. Um, I'll ask the thing here uh, about uh, something uh, I think uh, Wangsi was alluding to. Tansen, I'm sorry. Uh, could you please uh, oh, they, come over here? They are recording. Record and then they are, you know, I don't want my face to be on the. Uh, I'm asking a sensitive question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the use of uh, both the words institution and diaspora are problematic. Uh, I think uh, I didn't read through your paper, but I saw glimpses of it. I think you, you do mention uh, diffusion, uh, but diaspora itself is a problematic term. Uh, and uh, I don't know how you are placing Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. Uh, are they part of China or part of diaspora uh, by the state? Uh, and how, do you, how does the figure change if you remove Macau, Hong Kong, and Taiwan from the data, does it make, make a difference? Uh, and uh, diaspora is, is perhaps, uh, for sociologists and for historians, uh, is a long-term people staying abroad, perhaps second generation, third generation included. Uh, and, and the difference between those who go and study abroad and come back, uh, that's a different category. Comes out being went abroad and came back. You didn't put him up on, on, the, on the chart. <laughs> Uh, I think many of the Chinese leaders went to Russia and came back. Uh, so how do you differentiate that? Wouldn't that show up in your data that uh, diaspora uh, uh, is different uh, in different uh, parts of the world? And among diaspora, there are different categories. I think this was also mentioned uh, that there is an elite class, there is a working class, Middle Eastern workers from India. And same for Chinese going to Burma and to Southeast Asia, there's this lower level category of people, uh, also part of diaspora. So I, I think uh, it would be good to clarify, if you haven't clarified it in your paper or your book, uh, which diasporic component are you talking about? Uh, and you separate it from people who just go abroad to study uh, and come back. So Taipei, for example, in China, uh, are you also talking about these people who are coming back uh, to the So uh, I think you should problematize this word diaspora, or perhaps not use it at all. Uh, and, and so I don't know how you would you have dealt with it in your, in your paper or your book. Would you like to quickly yeah. respond? Uh, yeah, uh, Should actually, go to a microphone? I dealt with it because uh, that, that uh, was my uh, whole book, um, Different Kinds of Diasporas and the Impact. And this article is transitioned to the next one. So I really appreciate all the comments. Uh, and, and, and the concept I use is more like a transnational diaspora. It's more recent than the sociologist. And um, correctly, it's not uh, the, the conventional sociologist uh, usage of diaspora. So I uh, include um, Hong Kong in the 1980s, but not the, after 1997. Uh, and uh, uh, some of you may have the same uh, uh, puzzle, that is, if we take out Hong Kong, Macau for China's FDI data, the number will be dropped by at least 50% uh, uh, to 70%. And that's my main point. You know, with most of economists, uh, FDI defeats China's FDI as FDI, but m most of them are, um, are, are from Hong Kong and uh, Macau and Taiwan as well, and also the entry point. Those came earlier than the later. Uh, so, I, uh, so, and so they drive policy uh, reforms. So, um, uh, to conclude, you know, I, I really appreciate these, uh, these uh, highlights, and uh, I will definitely include them. But, uh, but a lot of the thinkings are in, are in, the, in, the, in, the, in the article, but also in the book. Uh, yes. So I it just because Tansen had raised this point. Um, I would still think though that it's very important for you to look at this Indian diaspora issue slightly more closely. Because there is an area of uh, diasporic activity which is genuinely old fashioned 
sociologically well-defined yes for activity, which is very important to the Indian economy. It tends to be informal, it is long-term, it is sustained, and it involves itself in extremely important informal monetary flows. Now, that operates in the West Asian region as well as in the South Asian region, and it is extremely poorly defined. Uh, this area is, some, uh, is something which we don't discuss beyond a certain point. It has always been on the margins of data collection. Uh, increasingly, it is attracting a degree of attention. It certainly exists as a very, very powerful means of moving money uh, across the world. Uh, I, I think, in fact, as a, since you're interested in diaspora, the fact that there is a link between the transnational of the present that you're dealing with and something which is more historic but persistent is something that perhaps in the Indian case you could bear in mind because it will help you compare the Chinese as well as the Indian cases more effectively. Because there is something long term in both which actually can be compared seriously. And the way in which it has changed or the way in which it is. Uh, map is something you should take into consideration. Okay, okay um, a quick, um, just to the presenters, could I request the presenters, all the uh, paper presenters, to quickly note the uh, responses because there's we're really running out of time and so Ashok has alerted me that there could be more uh, by way of feedback for you. Uh, so could I uh, um, ask if, yeah, please. Yeah, um, I have some questions and comments for, for all the papers, actually. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I can start with uh, media, the, since there has been discussion on this already. Um, my question to you is, is, I want to push the political argument that you uh, have in the, in, in the paper. And of course, I haven't read it, so maybe you explain this in more detail there. But you did mention that there is a difference as, as to how FDI flows are affected by a political machine. And that there is a difference between a democratic versus authoritarian government. And of course, we can push a lot as to whether India is really a democratic government. But um, the point here, nevertheless, is a little um, counterintuitive, if you want, because if you look at, uh, for example, FBI investments in Korea in the 60s and 70s, you can definitely say that this was not a democratic government, and it was precisely because it had an authoritarian regime that it worked. So um, maybe develop this, and perhaps because you say that you come from political science, that, that would be very interesting to develop. Um, my question for you, John, is, um, how how is that how is how are these different labor laws or labor regimes uh, and policies affecting domestic versus foreign companies? So is is it the same? Is it different? To what extent uh, today you can say that in India or China, foreign companies because they are pressured by international agreements. Um, really doesn't matter that much what the, the legislation of China or India is. Um, my question for, for the first paper uh, for Professor Lau is, are your suggestions something that um, the local people want? Or is this, um, are these suggestions um, from the core for the periphery as how the periphery should be developed? Is there any conversation between or suggestions among the people as to how um, any improvements need to be made and to what extent they align with, with what you're offering? And my last comments are, are actually comments, not uh, questions, uh, pursuing um, I, I very much agree with everything that uh, Professor Banerjee suggested to you, and, and I'm wondering whether it's possible to, for you to ground your um, paper in some specific moments of rupture, just like uh, she suggested, in some specific discourses uh, as to whether English or another language needs to take any type of dominance in India or China. 
And for the Chinese case, for example, you can look uh, at the boxer indemnities that sent a lot of um, Chinese students to the United States to study English. So what was their influence on the discourse of how English is developing in the country? Or maybe you can um, ground your discourse in something completely different. What about Hong Kong and Taiwan? What is the acceptance of English there versus the acceptance of English into China, which is such a vast place, it's very difficult to, to have a common denominator. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hola? Yeah, one comment. I mean, whenever one shows a graph or something, I think it's a good idea to source it. Because sometimes, you know, during the PowerPoint, particularly the fourth PowerPoint, I didn't see a lot of sources. And I think Wang Xi's comment is very essential here that good sources always make good presentations of the What's a good source? <laughs> well, acceptable <laughs> source. That is in the public domain. <laughs> Any, any other questions? Yeah, please. Uh, I have a question to, yeah. And, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, ma I'm making some research on Chinese uh, national system uh, recently. I have my question is, uh, do you think uh, Chinese nationality system is a barrier of the diffusion to China? China? <laughs> I'm sorry, we do. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we may not have. Later. Okay. Yes, and yes. I apologize. Uh, we will talk. Um, yeah, at this stage, we may not be able to get all responses from the presenters, but uh, yes, go ahead, uh, Prakash. Uh, my question is to you. Um, uh, speak loudly for everybody. Um, I wanted to ask you about the wage differential argument. Um, and you said that if the wage differential starts high, the labor, labor mobility is likely to be low. And this is kind of counterintuitive. Are you talking about some kind of threshold effects because the differences are too high and they are attached to some kind of professional barriers that you know, people from lower race categories cannot surpass or, or something like that? Because otherwise, you know, I would like to move into a high major race level category. If there are no more questions, then maybe we could give a minute or two to the presenters to uh, respond. Any more questions? Oh, no? we're done. Okay. Okay. Would you? Can I? Well, okay, I have a. Oh, 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 could I? Could I request you to come here and? Thanks for all the great questions and the comments from Professor Tri and. Uh, uh, lab team, and I think there are um, very uh, effective criticisms. I do think it's you know, but I think the one thing I want to just clarify, you know, about your last point about you know whether I was really celebrate you know this Chinese model. Well, absolutely not. I think I don't really think this is a, you know the you know the one of the better model to you know which um, other developing countries should follow. But I was just to point out they do have this kind of good, different path which needs to uh, you know look at from not just uh, simply you know democracy you know autocracy perspective but we have to look at all those micro mechanism and uh, speaking about this data you know uh, problem I do have a hard time to really compare those kind of you know data you know collected from China and India because simply because they do have a you know different statistics system and also you know the the base of their you know data point is actually very different so I think is there certainly there's a room to improve this data um, but I can comments on the you know the uh, you know a more specific question about the, this table on this. Uh, uh, employment, uh, informal and formal employment, and also you know your your comments about uh, those institutions uh, in in book and institutions in in practice. You know, uh, I agree that it certainly was you know um, probably you know Indian uh, implementation of the labor and the land institutions may be more flexible than it was you know um, in the, in paper, but so was. China, so which actually you do have this kind of institute, you know, labor laws and uh, land, inst you know, uh, regulations has been put on paper, but you know, the local government has really, you know, followed those, uh, you know, the uh, regulations. And uh, I do actually, I have the, you know, the uh, response to, I'm sorry, that that lady, you know, about the. Uh, 
uh, labor regulations, whether there are difference uh, in China and India. Yes, in China, uh, for the uh, from the 1980s to the late 1990s, there was actually was a difference between, you know, the um, the foreign uh, firms and the domestic or uh, uh, state-owned enterprises. They do have actually followed the different labor regulations because there is a specific, you know, regulations uh, for the foreign firms which would actually uh, um, give them more flexibility in hiring and firing. Uh, the Indian side, at least on paper, there's actually no, you know, uh, they, they, they're using the same, you know, labor uh, 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 regulations on, at the, the federal level, but, uh, loc uh, you know, local governments do have the different kind of, you know, practice. So another uh, last point, um, well, uh, Professor Tris, you know, points about, you, you know, the, uh, maybe I should just reframe this, you know, the um, uh, hypothesis from the global chain perspective. Yes, I think this is actually just very, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, insightful, you know, suggestion. Uh, I think as I follow this model, which is, uh, you consider as more, you know, a classical, but maybe it's outdated model, uh, simply because, we, you know, we were just trying to make it um, kind of like a, this con comparison is more like, you know, uh, doesn't really uh, reflect in this, you know, uh, the classical, you know, prediction. But, you, you know, your uh, comments on the, you know, the new uh, collect, uh, global chain perspective is actually is very um, uh, Im important. And uh, lastly, about Prakash's uh, comments on the, you know, w why the wage difference, uh, what's the relationship between the wage difference and the labor mobility? Well, I think this is, you know, the assumption is, you know, if you have a, uh, there's no restriction on the uh, labor mobility. You know, uh, workers will be have the incentive to move from a low-paid you know job to the high-paid job, and eventually you, you will see actually there's no um, difference across you know different industries uh, because you know uh, that would be a formed equilibrium. So if you see there's wage differences, you know, the, the assumption is, you know, there are some barriers between this, you know, the uh, uh, regulations actually, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 constrain those laborers from, you know, uh, moving from one job, uh, one low paid, in, uh, you know, jobs to a high paid job. So, so that's actually those kind of assumptions. So we can use is the, uh, the higher the wage difference across industries and, uh, you know, the, the lower uh, labor mobility, you know, um, uh, you know, the o occupational labor mobility. Okay, I was just going to be sh uh, brief, and then uh, thank you. Would you like to respond quickly? Uh, we'll be really brief. Yes. You sure? Uh, yes, the, 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 <laughs> there is a, <laughs> a request from... Well, uh, I, I just want to um, thank all the, um, the, the commentators and uh, questions from the audience, and uh, this is an ongoing project. I, I, uh, my earlier book will be out in the summer, and this is leading to the next one. But at BU, I'm also starting a new course on Asian immigration and development. So if you have any uh, material, like, if, uh, 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 like particularly on India, and a classic work on this immigration diaspora, and uh, please just uh, send to me and I'll be really happy to, to, to incorporate in the teaching material and also you know, try to synthesize this into a bigger project. And uh, many thanks, and uh, I would allow to carry on the conversations um, uh, during the lunch break, receptions, and uh, following this workshop. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Well, Tom, would you like to respond? Well, uh, regarding question about, you know, uh, the suggestions which I made in my paper, uh, well, some of the suggestions are basically from the perspective of periphery, the people in, in, in the uh, marginal areas that they want uh, particularly, you know, uh, they want greater interactions for, I mean, cross-border trade. They want, you know, uh, easier border or rather softer border for tourism. They want it for, you know, pilgrimage. But as far as, you know, other suggestion goes, it was, you know, from the perspective I made that, you know, uh, our peripheries, we can, in, in, in due course of time, we can visualize it at the new core. Periphery does not need to be, you know, periphery forever. It can be a gateway to our neighbors and, and even beyond. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I feel very grateful for uh, the uh, professor's uh, valuable comments and suggestions. 
and for my further okay, um, improvement and uh, revision. Okay, and uh, um, for this uh, paper, I think that uh, some of uh, the most necessary one is the title. The object needs to be redefined, and uh, maybe the uh, the attitudes needs uh, needs to be narrowed down, narrowed down. And uh, here in my paper, the Chinese attitude does not include uh, those from Hong Kong or Macau. Okay, and uh, um, some of my contents and the structures of the paper needs to be reorganized, and um, more aspects to be integrated into the paper to make it more complete. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Suying. Uh, I think with that we conclude the first session. A big thanks to all the four, all the four presenters and all the discussions and uh, the Q&A um, uh, participation from the audience. Uh, maybe now, may I now invite everyone uh, to lunch? <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs>